Gracious and loving God, may only your words be spoken. May only your words be heard. Amen. We have a banner that sometimes hangs on our front lawn here at St. Paul's. It reads, love God, love your neighbor, change the world. We know that, according to the Jewish Shema in, from Deuteronomy, quoted by Jesus and recited at the start of our worship here this morning, the two great commandments are to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. I wonder, though, if given the choice, would you rather do something to show your love of God or do something to show your love for your neighbor? It's a trick question, of course, because we cannot do one without doing the other. Loving God is loving our neighbor, and loving our neighbor is loving God. To try to choose between loving God and loving our neighbor is to engage, I think, in a false dichotomy. Choosing one and neglecting the other is to lose an anchor that keeps us tethered to the heart of God. Choosing to love our neighbor without loving God makes what we do for our neighbor about us, about our goodness, and not about participating in God's mission for the world, sharing what God has given us with those who God has called us to serve. Choosing only to love God at the expense of loving our neighbor is at best blasphemous. It would grieve the Spirit of God to receive adoration for show and not as a source and means toward justice and reconciliation and liberation of all of God's beloved children. It is easy, though, to find fault with someone else's attempt to pour themselves out in hopes of loving God more deep, dearly, that they may see God more clearly in the world around them. There is always, isn't there, something or someone we think more or less deserving of whatever resources are being shared. It costs me nothing to point that out so that all may know who or what is important to me and then do nothing to follow through on my words. Our world is filled to the brim with people who have ideas and shoulds. There are many fewer who will and who do. How easy it is, I think, for Judas to watch the scene before him unfold and at just the right time signal his virtue from the edge of the crowd in an attempt to undercut and shame this woman who dared pour out all she could in an extravagant display of love and devotion so close to Jesus that she could wipe his feet with her hair. Now, of course, Judas is not wrong. And that little bit about Judas' motives in John's Gospel, that's editorial. Let's just, for the sake of our conversation this morning, assume Judas' motive was truly to point out what he saw as a complete waste of valued resources. It's funny, though, 
that Judah's commitment to the poor somehow still allows him to be a guest in this woman's home. His concern doesn't stop him from accepting her hospitality, eating her food, drinking her wine, receiving her warm welcome. Surely, everything that was spent to throw this celebratory feast for Jesus after he raised Lazarus from the dead, it all could have gone to feed the poor, to clothe the naked. So maybe that isn't his issue. There's something about Mary's boldness, something about her strength to walk to the middle of a room filled with men break open an alabaster jar and let its contents flow out in abundance. Stephanie Spellers writes in her book, The Church Cracked Open, quote, does she offer the jar to Jesus? Maybe pour some nard into her hand and anoint Jesus? No, she breaks the alabaster jar. The crack and the crash must have felt like lightning and thunder. Our sister has no interest in a stingy drip drip from the jar's small opening. She wants the healing nard to continue to flow onto Jesus like rivers, like power. And there is only one way to get that kind of free flow. Crack it open. Spellers continues, already you can see why the Gospel of Luke, in Luke's version of this story, assumes she's a sinner, and later scholars paint her as a prostitute. What other type of woman would be wealthy enough to possess a jar of perfumed ointment and bold enough to walk into a room full of men? What kind of woman would initiate such a dramatic and sensuous in the truest sense of the word gesture. A woman of means, a woman with her own ideas, a woman to be reckoned with." End quote. Judas responds to, Jesus responds to Judas's rebuke with words that can be hard for our modern ears to hear. You always have the poor with you, Jesus says, but you do not always have me. It can sound a bit like let them eat cake if we do not care to unpack what Jesus just might be saying here. It might be that Jesus is trying to undo the false dichotomy that Judas has posed for the crowd and remind him that the closer they pull toward him, the closer they will be to those Jesus loves and cares for. You could not be in that crowd. You could not be a follower of Jesus and not be forced into proximity with the poor. You could not want to be near Jesus and not end up eating next to someone with whom you'd rather not. You could not want to hear what Jesus had to say and not hear the voices of those who had been silenced. To put Jesus at the center of your world is to put the historically disinherited in that very same place. We can imagine that if Mary and Martha could afford to host this gathering and have a jar of nard sitting by on a shelf, they could afford to feed the hungry outside their door. And we can assume that they did just that. Because they loved Jesus that much. And loving God that much set them free to love their neighbor that much. What Judas offers in this story is performance. What Mary offers 
is proximity. If we keep God with us, we will always have the poor with us. We cannot love God. We cannot love God and not love the ones God loves. It isn't enough to say we love God without acting like we do. Spellers writes, quote, What did Jesus notice and admire so much in her? He didn't see waste. He understood that she was literally giving up the best of what she had, the alabaster jar and the nard, because he mattered that much to her. He was the Holy One, the center of her world, and she had reoriented her life around him as her focus." End quote. God does not need our performance. God needs our proximity. God does not need us to be careful, scared of making a mistake or being called out, that instead we do nothing but yell what others ought to be doing somewhere from the edge. You, my friends, are vessels filled to the brim with the healing ointment of God's love for this world. Do not hold back. Do not be afraid there isn't enough. Do not worry that there might be a better way to love in some better way on some better day. Don't listen to the voices from the edge that are ready to point out how you are falling short in their sight. Love God. Break yourself open at God's very feet. And let the love of God flow from you like fine oil over the world God has made. Love your neighbor. And let the whole world be filled with the fine fragrance of God's abundant love. Amen.